welcome to the disturbance. Uh, what? What? Alright, hey, honey, I'm in the middle of doing a voiceover on Fiverr for one of those earthlings that does something called a podcast. Alright, alright, I'll take out the trash when I'm done. Welcome to the disturbance hosted by Dave Devon. Coming up on The Disturbance, I've got Brad Hoyseth with me to help me actually preview the National Football League North, as well as we're going to get Brad Hoyseth's highly coveted, and I do mean highly coveted, thoughts on fantasy football. All of that, and trust me, a whole lot more coming up on The Disturbance uh, today. I'm Dave DeBoss. That is Brad Hoyseth right there, if if you're looking at him. If you're uh, listening to the show for the very first time and you're on YouTube, you might see a big red subscribe button. If you do, go ahead and hit that. If you're listening to us on any of the hundreds of platform, audio platforms that exist across the world, go ahead and subscribe to the show. Hey, Brad, I don't know if you know, uh, but the disturbance uh, has officially been picked up by iHeartRadio awesome. as, uh, as of yesterday. So uh, the show's reach is just, it's getting huge. I just, I don't even know what to say about that. It's borderline disturbing. <laughs> it is borderline disturbing, exactly. So Brad, um, now we should say, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, both Brad and I, uh, uh, come originally from uh, the Midwest, which, which actually makes both of us um, Minnesota Viking fans, um, which is a good thing and a bad thing. If you like to be ridiculed about never winning a Super Bowl, uh, then maybe it's a good thing. Um, but if you're a big fan of just simply making the playoffs fairly consistently year in and year out, then, you know, you are the prototypical Minnesota Viking fan who just expects to come near uh, to actually making the playoffs. Mr. Hoyseth, let's get into the National Football League North, shall we? Where would you like to start? Well, Debaugh, I know that we are both Vikings fans. But as a Vikings fan, you have to be a little bit disturbed about the offensive line and you know there was some uh reports that maybe they were going to deal riley rife away and you know let's face it uh kirk cousins is a mediocre quarterback who can look decent at times when he's got protection but he can look horrendous at times when he does not and uh you know it seems as if they've kind of worked out something with rife now but It's just another year that's gone by that it just seems like they have ignored the offensive line as if it's a non-important position or a non-essential part of the offense. And, you know, now you don't have Stephon Diggs. And um, I I just just don't think things are going in the right directions pre-snap, shall we say, for the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah, as as a myopic Minnesota Viking fan, you know, I tend to take a very – you know, positive uh, yet guarded approach to the uh, to the team, and I agree. This this offensive line is is not what I would consider to be a Super Bowl caliber offensive line at this point. Look, even with a healthy Riley Reef, you're still not you're still not really sitting there in a in a great position. And then, obviously, as you pointed out, the loss of Diggs, uh, bringing in Justin Jefferson, a a rookie wide receiver um, who you know, for all intensive purposes, looks pretty good in, um, in training camp. But that's without pads on. That's without, you know, any real contact. We, we don't know how he's, he's actually going to deal with the pressure. And you and I both know that we can expect as great as Adam Thielen can be. Um, but I know there's a reason why you don't take Adam Thielen in your fantasy football team. Because you know that Adam Thielen will let you down for four to six games a year because of a hamstring injury. I mean, what's the over under on him making it through the first half of the first game without coming down with a hamstring injury? You know, my biggest problem with Thielen this year is that in past years, he's had Stefan Diggs on the other side of the field. And yeah. so 
he now becomes the number one. He now faces double coverage. And now you got some guy named B.C. Johnson who has stepped into a starting role in the offense. And uh, that just sends up red flags for me everywhere. Yeah. yeah I, I, I don't blame you. I'm not even sure you can get, you can get a, a B.C. Johnson jersey on uh, NFL shop <laughs> at this point. I'm not even sure it exists there. Yeah, the, the, the Vikings wide receiver core, I mean, it, you know, when, when your third or fourth best wide receiver on the team is, is Chad Beebe, um, you know, you've got, a, you've got a potential issue. And then you talk about Kirk Cousins being your starting quarterback. And, and I'm not an anti, you know, Kirk Cousins fan. Um, you know, he's, he manages the game nicely. Nobody hands off a football like Kirk Cousins does in the National Football League. I mean, the way he securely puts the ball into, into Dalvin Cook's chest is, is really at a level that, uh, that very few quarterbacks have actually made it to. Um, but, uh, you know, roll him out a couple of times, keep him kind of safe. He'll, you know, he'll, he'll end up with a quarterback ranking at the end of the year somewhere between 85 and 95. And that's serviceable in the National Football League. It's just that you've got to have more offensive weapons around him which is why this is just going to be no matter how bad that offensive line is, they're still going to, you know, run the ball, um, you know, two out of four times in each series. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. You know, if there is a guy that I would suspect will become more involved in that offense this year, I would say it's second year tight end Irv Smith. I mean, I, he kind of showed flashes of, being a pretty good player down the stretch last year, got a little bit more involved in the offense. He's got a little bit more speed than somebody like Kyle Rudolph. And um, with the absence of Diggs, um, I can only assume that Irv Smith is one of those guys that if you're playing fantasy football, maybe he's a late round flyer as a guy that could potentially have a breakout year. But having said all this, I know this is what you really want to get around to, and this is your NFC North predictions i'm going to go out on a flyer here and i'm going to give all the listeners on our heart radio and whatever other radio you got here on the disturbance daba and i'm going to say the detroit lions of all teams now that's a bold prediction i'm taking the detroit lions to win the north um <clears throat> that is um yes absolutely it is absolutely disturbing that you would actually take the detroit lions you know is is um Who's their running back on that team? Like they, they haven't had like a, like a decent running back there since since Barry Sanders. Look, I'm a big fan of Matthew Stafford, um, and I, I think he's always um, sort of had to had to do a lot with with nothing really sort of around him. Um, so I believe in Matthew Stafford. I, I you know to me Matthew Stafford is sort of a is sort of the uh, NFC North version. Um, of of uh, Philip Rivers, he's just going to put up big numbers. He's going to be fun to watch play. He's going to sit in the pocket and and take a beating. And when you get into that third and fourth quarter, you're never really out of a football game with Matthew Stafford. I mean, that is that is the uh, that is the reality of this uh, Detroit Lions team. You might be Brad, <laughs> one of the. Uh, only people in North America to actually go out on such a limb and, and actually pick the Detroit Lions. Well, I like Carryon Johnson. I mean, you say that who's their running back, but I think Carryon Johnson is a good football player. They drafted a kid with the last name Swift who could be a decent player. You know, they get, they get Stafford back, who was injured last year for most of the season. Kenny Galladay had kind of a breakout season. And I, I like the coaching staff. I think, uh, I think they're headed in the right direction. And in light of the fact that the Vikings don't seem to have solved some issues and they've lost some pieces, uh, and, and an aging you know, Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay and a, and a Chicago team that just doesn't look like they have anything. You know, I remember when I was a kid, you all, you all remember the Minnesota North Stars, of course. And the North Stars played in a division called the Norris Division. And at one point, the Norris division was terrible. Nobody finished over 500. And Sports Illustrated put out an article called How They Bore Us in the Norris. And so, <laughs> I, you know, I think if you're going to have one of those breakthrough teams, 
I think the NFC North is one that's ripe for the picking. I mean, I, I don't see anybody else there that's spectacular. I don't see a deep playoff team there. And so I think if you're going to go out on a limb, uh, take some good odds in Vegas, I think the Detroit Lions are a decent pick. Yeah, um, uh, well, that's good. So so there you go. That's, that's Brad Hoysa's pick to click to win the NFC North. He's, he's, he's taking the Detroit Lions. Um, uh, before we get into the, the, the coveted Dave DeBaugh prediction, um, what do you think, and, and we're going to save the best for last, because, Brad, there, 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 there's nothing better than a quarterback controversy in Chicago. So we're going we're gonna to save the Bears for last. What do you think about uh, the Green Bay Packers this year? Look, they were one game away from the Super Bowl, though I, I, I will say, you know, everybody says that. Oh, there's just one game away from the Super Bowl. If you go back and look at that NFC championship game, they were two games or three games away from the Super Bowl. Like the 49ers last year at the end of the year were light years ahead of where the Green Bay Packers were. Yes, I know statistically they were just a game away, but from a uh, sort of a player personnel standpoint, they just really weren't quite there yet. What do you think of this Packer team with a, with a, a new – uh, quarterback just sitting there waiting, you know, for the next year or two in Jordan Love to push Aaron Rodgers out so that Aaron Rodgers can eventually sign with the Dallas Cowboys and Dak Prescott can become a Minnesota Viking. Uh, what are your thoughts on all of that? Well, I, I think if, if there is one positive for Aaron Rodgers, it's that now they've sent him a message. And does he play this season with an ax to grind and say, you know what? You're all wrong about me. I'm not getting old. I'm still one of the best quarterbacks in the league. And when, you know, kind of put to the coals like that, Rodgers tends to respond and play pretty well. Um, and I, by the way, I just looked at the Las Vegas odds and the Lions are picked to finish dead last. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, to me, they've just – really never put the pieces around that guy to win a Super Bowl since he was very young. I think it's really shameful. Um, Devontae Adams is a special player. Uh, the running back's a special player. But the offensive line has been patchwork for a number of years. And the defense has just been, you know, like a turnstile for a number of years. So uh, I just don't know that they have uh, really the full, uh, you know, complement of players to make any kind of run. I just don't see it. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, look, it, here's my theory on all of this. First of all, it's, there, there's only the New England Patriots uh, of the last 20 years in the National Football League. There's been one organization that's actually figured out how to, how to win Super Bowls at a, at a dynasty level. Whereas, you know, we've had, we've had the, um, the Saints win a Super Bowl, you know, sort of teams winning one-off Super Bowls. Um, and, and this whole thing about Aaron Rodgers should have, should have two or three Super Bowls al already. While it, while it might be true, the reality is you're absolutely correct. This organization in Green Bay, um, which is one of the best places to catch a football game. <laughs> now, it's going to be tough this year, but given the chance to get to Lambeau Field, and catch a football game, especially in the winter, um, is, is something that, you know, is, uh, is sort of the mecca of, of uh, places for football fans to go. That being said, like, I just, I look at this, this team and, and this organization, and I think it actually sort of suffers from the way the ownership group is sort of structured and set up. The fact that there isn't really a clear owner of the Green Bay Packers the fact that Brad Hoyseth, as a Minnesota Viking fan living in California, probably got a, a holiday gift somewhere along the line where somebody bought him a share of the Packers. Like, the lack of ownership or the lack of leadership at that level is, is really what has sort of done in the, uh, the organization. And you could see it this year in the draft. We talk about the Minnesota Vikings having issues at wide receiver, and, and we're right. 
but at least they picked somebody early in the draft. They didn't, they didn't go ahead and pick the heir apparent to Kirk Cousins. Uh, that's, that's, because, that's because they knew there was no heir apparent to Kirk Cousins in the, Nash, in the draft this year, especially where, where they were picking. So the Packers really, nothing against Jordan Love. Um, he might turn out to be a serviceable quarterback someday, but I don't see Jordan Love turning into the next Aaron Rodgers or the next Brett Favre at all. I, 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 I just don't see. I see him turning into the next Mitchell Trubisky. You know, I think what they saw in him is the comparisons were drawn between Jordan Love and Patrick Mahomes. Um, <clears throat> young kid, strong arm, fairly mobile, can think on his feet. Uh, but uh, the reality is, is that he's still a long, long ways away from being a guy that is going to displace Aaron Rodgers from the starting lineup. Um, you know, and, and uh, they just, there's just not a lot of talent there. I mean, you know, they, they've got a basically equivalent of a rookie tight end and Jay Sternberger. You've got Devonte Adams and, and Aaron Jones. And really um, there's nothing else there to get excited about, including an offensive line that is again, not going to protect Aaron Rodgers very well. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I, I, they're the favorites in Vegas to win the North. I don't see it. Uh, but maybe the drafting of love is the kind of spark that Aaron Rodgers needs to, uh, you know, get himself reinterested in winning big football games for the Packers. Yeah. And um, maybe even, uh, maybe, maybe even not condescend uh, the rest of the offensive players on his team. I, I saw Rodgers in a uh, interview earlier today and it was, it was, he looked like a man who knew he was being kicked out of his gig and he was starting to um, sort of act like a guy who wanted to stay. So he was sort of saying and doing the right things um, and sort of that, you know, look, you've got to have an ego to be a great quarterback in the National Football League. So I'm not knocking him for that, but um, he was less pompous than before. And that's maybe the best way to describe I'll send you the video, Hoy said. Yeah, well, speaking of Aaron Rodgers, I'm going to give myself a plug here. On jcgridiron.com, my site, Unrivals, right now I am running down the top 100 junior college football players of all time. Aaron Rodgers is a top 10 guy. It's a pretty exciting read. I'm uh, getting ready to release players 41 through 50 here any day. Uh, that list is going to include Alvin Kamara and Tyreek Hill. So uh, if there's people out there looking for an interesting read of the top 100 junior college football players of all time, you'd be really surprised to see some of the names in there. I mean, it's kind of a who's who. There's about 25 guys in the Pro Football Hall of Fame that got their start at the, uh, at the uh, junior college level. So if you get a chance, stop by J.C. Gridiron and uh, subscribe, and uh, you'll get a whole lot of stuff there that I think uh, you're probably not going to get anywhere else out there. You're not going to get it on iHeart Media, <laughs> Dabba. There's, you're not finding that stuff out there, right? But no, and, know, Aaron Rodgers. Aaron and, Rodgers is, uh, you know, <laughs> between him and Cam Newton and Kamara and Tyreek Hill, uh, you'd be surprised at some of the names of guys. I'm going to try to fill my entire fantasy football roster with junior college guys this year. That's my goal. Nice, nice. You should at least do that with one of your 15 fantasy football leagues. Brad plays in so many leagues that, that, he, uh, that, that he plays in so many that he's bound to win at least one. That's right. Um, that is uh, that's always a always a good strategy. Yeah, look, um, uh, you know, I think the the junior college perspective on all of this is um, is is really interesting, and and a lot of people just don't realize it. Uh, it's a great site. You guys should definitely check it out. Uh, check out this um, uh, this list, um, and it's it's amazing to think about. You know, the best really. Like if you go around the media today. And, and you were to sit down with, you know, the top 100 people in the media today, um, which, which would be, uh, you know, a difficult conversation to have. But if you were to sit down and ask them one question, who is the greatest quarterback you've seen play in your lifetime? You know, 70% of those people would probably say Aaron Rodgers. I mean, that is, that is the, uh, you know, the level of, um, of greatness that, that Aaron Rodgers um, displayed. And can you imagine 
see, coming up against Aaron Rodgers in a in, in 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 a junior college football game, what that was what that was probably like. Yeah, yeah. You know, the funny thing is, is that the old uh, the old I guess myth I would call it that's out there was that the junior college was always filled with the dumb guys, which. You know, if you look at some of the guys in the league, I don't think anybody would say Aaron Rodgers or Julian Edelman are dumb by any means. And so I, on my site, what I've tried to do is I've tried to break that myth and say that, you know, most of the guys playing junior college football are there because either A, they were, you know, a couple inches too small in high school. Maybe they played for a bad team. They didn't get a lot of exposure. Maybe they bounced back from a Division One college because they had some issues with their eligibility. But you know, the lion's share of guys that are playing junior college football, the difference academically between them and the guy that actually is playing Division One football is very minute. It's very small. Yeah. And so <laughs> the guys go and they play junior college football for a variety of reasons. And, um, you know, socioeconomically, a lot of them don't have a lot of money. Um, as I said, they come from schools where, you know, their high school team went one and nine and uh, just nobody was watching them, or or maybe they didn't. Uh, they're an offensive lineman that weighed 250 pounds in high school, and now you know a year and a half later they weigh 285, 290. So th- there's just an amazing amount of uh, guys that um, you know have developed into great players, and you know I I, I could get the who's who really um, of of guys that I think in a lot of cases, people don't realize even played junior college football. You know, somebody like Warren Moon, for instance. You know, a lot of people don't know Warren Moon played junior college football. Um, You know, somebody like Roger Staubach, for instance, played junior college football. So it's really, there's so many big names that guys that are in the Hall of Fame, you just go, wow, I I had no idea. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's a fascinating um, sort of thing. You know, like... Um, as as sort of middle, um, the TV show as Brad Hoiseff's backyard looks, um, you know, that plot of land right there is in Southern California. And that that is valuable. And it has gotten so crazy expensive uh, to live in, in California. I'm up in Northern California, Brad's in Southern California. And the, the the cost to uh, you know for me to send my kids to a four year school versus um, versus two years at a at a great you know I've got a lot of great junior colleges up here which are you know the kids are going to get the basic same level of education that they would get at a, at a, at a four year school regardless of if they play sports or not so I, I I think the you know the the sort of the stigma of junior colleges and junior college football and junior college sports that we might have seen back in, you know, the nineties um, and eighties, you know, has, has definitely changed, uh, changed a lot. Um, yeah. The, the, the talent level now playing is, you know, I've been covering it for 16 years Yeah, and it has increased exponentially. And a lot of that is that, Uh, many people don't know a lot about it. I mean, California has its own junior college system and then the rest of the country plays under a different umbrella. And one of the challenges in California is that they don't have scholarships and that they don't have housing. Well, the rest of the country has scholarships and dorm rooms. And so you'll see a lot of just really high profile players now in Kansas and Mississippi and you know, you go watch them play. And, it, you know, I remember I used to go to a decent game 15 years ago here in California. You might see, you know, two, three, five guys that, if it's a good game, that really look like potentially really great Division One prospects. But, you know, you go watch somebody like East Mississippi play Northwest Mississippi. You know, you're looking at 40 to 50 D1 athletes that are out there on the field. And, and it's uh, it's a really impressive display. Uh, that it's a good product now that's out there and it's cheap. It's, it's affordable to go watch. I, I wish we could get more people interested in it, but uh, we can't seem to get them out of high school football and, you know, where they're going to a game and they're watching a couple of kids that are okay. But uh, the reality is, is that there's not much of a future there for the kid when yeah. it comes to football. <laughs> but anyways, I didn't want to get you distracted on this deal. You got me on Aaron Rodgers, and that's a soft spot for me, Dabba. <laughs> uh, speaking of um, uh, speaking of soft spots, um, 
We've got one last team to cover here in the NFC North. And that, of course, is the, you know, the, the prodigy, the prodigy of, of, of Matt Nagy as the uh, head coach of the Chicago Bears. Matt Nagy is going to make everything right. I almost feel bad for Matt Nagy, who, who in his first season as head coach of the team, where they win like 12 games, won the division. And then in his second season, where they go eight and eight, um, he's, he's, he's done, um, if, if, if you look at it, he's done a nice job, at least on paper. You're not going to win every year in the National Football League. It's unrealistic to think that. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm not picking the Packers to win the division this year. But You're picking um, the Bears? No, nah, I didn't say that either. Um, but um, the question is, if you're Matt Nagy and you go ahead and spend a couple dollars to bring in the train wreck that was Nick Foles, and there should be no doubt in anybody's mind who's listening to this right now what I think of Nick Foles at this stage of his career train wreck that is Nick Foles. Look, I guess maybe everybody's a train wreck in Jacksonville. Hell, if you run for 1,200 yards as a member of the Jacksonville Jaguars, you will be released, Brad. (laughs) You are gone. That is is way too much success. You got to stop that, Mr. Fournette. Um, So I guess, what do you think of this whole quarterback controversy between Mitchell Trubisky Nick Foles, and where do you see the Chicago Bears ending up at the end of the year? You know, I think Mitch Trubisky has got one more chance. Um, And, you know, the Bears brought in a guy that has had some success as a backup in Nick Foles. And you can say whatever you want about Nick Foles. But the guy that produced the best results in the last five years for the Philadelphia Eagles was Nick Foles. It was not Carson Wentz. Let's not forget that. And so um, I think there is a certain offense that he could fit into and do some things right. Uh, And Trubisky, I I think they've reached a point to him where, okay, it's, what is it, year three now, something like that. And you got to start producing at some point. I mean, you know, that's an important position, and um, you have to be more efficient and more consistent than what Trubisky has been. Um, You know, I've always kind of argued that I don't really believe they've surrounded the guy with a ton of talent. You know, I think if you look at quarterbacks, a lot of them fail because there's just nothing there. Um, You know, they got Tariq Cohen at running back, and he's a decent player, and they've got, you know, they brought in an old guy, Ted Ginn, to play wide receiver this year. Uh, Allen Robinson, you know, he was a guy that was a cast-off from the Jacksonville Jaguars. I just don't see the talent surrounding Mitch Trubisky to allow him to have a whole lot of success. And I think by mid sixth season, uh, they may give up on the guy because I don't see the bears going anywhere this year. Yeah. <clears throat> I, um, I, I, you know, the NFL is great because you can be a, a first year head coach in the national football league and, um, and sort of have a new bag of tricks that you bring in, in, into the league. And this is one of the reasons I think, you know, Zach Taylor's definitely going to be looking for a new job at the end of the year uh, with the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, and, and so, you know, Matt Nagy definitely had that. And then, you know, defenses um, and defensive coordinators, um, they're smart. They, they know how to, they know what you're doing and will eventually catch on. There isn't anything that you can, you can sort of present to a, um, uh, to a defensive uh, coordinator that they're not eventually going to sort of figure out. I mean, just look at what the Tennessee Titans did to Lamar Jackson last year in the playoffs. They, 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 they figured out how to, uh, how, to, um, how to shut him down. And, you know, this year, of course, everybody's going to go ahead and they're going to they're gonna try to duplicate what Tennessee did. And that's not necessarily going to work because John Harbaugh is smart and they're not going to have the same exact style offense that they had last year. That's <laughs> the ebbs and flows of the National Football League. That's sort of the beauty of it all. Um, so I think like bringing in a guy like Nick Foles to be your um, starting quarterback, you know, signing him, especially all after all the success that, as you mentioned, he had in, in Philadelphia. Look, if, if, he was, if Frank Reich was there, I would probably feel a little bit differently about this. 
Um, but you know, his, his sort of, um, you know, you know, like your kids, Brad, when they were little, they, <laughs> they had, they had pacifiers, uh, or they had, they had a blanket, you know, something that they, you know, they always had with them at all times when they were little kids. Um, you know, Nick Foles' pacifier, I think is actually Frank Wright. Um, so I, I, I think what we're actually looking at here with this, this particular team is, is, um, you know, Matt Nagy's got a really interesting decision to make. He's, he spent some money. He brought in Nick Foles. Um, you know, everybody said, well, you're not going to go spend that kind of money on, on Nick Foles and then not make him the starting quarterback. But I agree with you. Uh, I, I, I think Mitchell Trubisky has earned, uh, at the very least, you know, three games at the start of the season to be the starting quarterback for this team. Um, as much as I personally dislike the Bears organization, I can be objective about this. And if, if I were a Bears fan, I would want to, you know, I would want to try Mitchell for at least a quarter of this season, see what happens. And if it doesn't work out, because it's, it's, it's not like we have any, you know, real live fire happening at practice. So both Trubisky and, and Foles are probably going to look pretty equal. Uh, while they're while they're throwing the, you know throwing the balls like at practice like I, I don't know about you but I haven't heard that anybody has actually stood out like one's playing better than the other there hasn't been any of those kinds of things so I think you give it to Mitchell Trubisky and you see you see what he can do um, and I, I actually think that they you know from a scheme perspective if they can um, you know, get Mitchell to do a couple things differently than he, than he's done in the past and not hold on to the ball for as long. Um, if he can do the one second, two second count, Brad, then, um, then, then maybe the, uh, the, the Chicago bears can be, uh, successful. Um, I, I think the Vikes are going to win the division at, at 10 and six. I've got the Packers, um, at, at nine and seven and, I, I, there's just something about like, just, I'm sure by the time we publish this podcast, they will have decided to make Nick Foles the starting quarterback of that team. But at this moment, I'm going to say that the, uh, the Chicago bears are, are going to go eight and eight this year. And, wow. and, and I will say that I don't think, uh, the Detroit lions by any stretch of the imagination are, are going to win the division um, unless there's a, a ton of injuries in this division. I would give them six wins at the most uh, for, for the Lions this year. And unlike you, Brad, I do not believe in uh, their head coach. Uh, I think he's a good defensive coordinator, um, but I, I don't believe, him, believe in him as a, a leader of an entire team. Um, I, I haven't seen it yet, so we'll, we'll need to see. Well... The Chicago Bears, uh, I don't think there's any question how they're going to try, to try to win games. They're going to try to win with defense. You know, they've got Khalil Mack and Danny Trevathan and, you know, Robert Quinn, and they've got, you know, a decent corner in Kyle Fuller, and uh, they got a rookie, Jalen Johnson. they got Akeem Hicks. I mean, they're, if they're going to win games, it's going to be with the defense. I mean, um, you know, Jimmy Graham's now the tight end, and – he's really not that much to get excited about anymore. And, you know, Ted Ginn is, uh, is a guy that's been in the league for a long, long time. So they brought in, I think, some veterans on offense um, to try to give uh, them a little more experience. They, they seem to be changing the parts every single year. So yeah. maybe the Foles is, is part of that plan. You know, you're bringing in some, some experience in Foles and Jimmy Graham and Ted Ginn and all these guys. Um, and, and maybe they figure if we, if we can hold teams to 17 points or less, uh, we could score enough to win more games than we lose. Uh, but, uh, my order of finish in the NFC North is going to be the Detroit lions. And then it is going to be the green Bay Packers and then the Vikings and then the bears, uh, I, as much as I'm a Vikings fan, uh, I'm really disappointed in what they've done on the offensive line. I see them struggling offensively. They've lost some big parts on the defense. There's just a lot of components there that have to come together. No preseason to work with. Uh, too many rookies got to get in and play right away. Yeah. Um, so there you have it, North America. Two vastly, two guys from basically the same city with two vastly different opinions on what's going to happen in the NFC North this year. 
it'll be interesting to see. The Bears will probably win the whole division after all of this. Yep. Um, and uh, and and the Packers will probably um, uh, you know go three and thirteen, and you know Matt Matt Lafleur will be out looking for a gig, and you know who knows the Vikes will will end up in the middle of the road where they always seem to be, um, except for those less stuckle years. Um, thought you'd like that. Uh, Mr. Hoyseth, okay, uh, before we get out of here, any uh, words of wisdom for, for the people, for the people? You are a people's man. Any words of wisdom about uh, their upcoming fantasy football drafts? Now, I, I think at this point, you're, you're running up against it. Most people are, are you know, have already drafted or, or will be drafting this weekend. What kind of uh, last-minute sage advice would you like to give to folks? I think the key here is with the coronavirus and not a lot of time for practice and preseason games. I think in the first three, four rounds of your draft, you take fairly conservative picks. And that doesn't mean the guy can't be talented. I'm, I'm just saying you look at something like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, for instance. A lot of people have Mike Evans ranked very high and they got Tom Brady now. Ah, there's just a lot of things there. I don't know what are going to happen. Uh, and so, you know, whereas Mike Evans might be a late second, early third round pick, I might let that guy go down the road a little bit just because I don't really know what that's going to look like. You know, somebody like Tampa Bay, I have a feeling it's going to look a lot more like the New England Patriots from years past where they're matriculating the ball down the field, which would mean uh, Mike Evans, he, he's an aerial guy. He's an over the top guy. And so I would stay away from guys like that. I, you know, look at, teams where they've made a lot of changes maybe they have a coaching change different offensive coordinator and I, I would stick with in the first two three rounds more conservative picks teams that haven't changed a lot the New Orleans Saints haven't changed a lot to what they're going to do you know uh, I would stick with those picks because I think a lot of fantasy football le leagues are lost in the first three rounds of the draft that's my advice yeah and um, uh, if you haven't heard the news Alvin Kamara Back in, um, back in uh, good old training camp earlier today, and, and Sean Payton in his uh, post-practice uh, post press conference, we've, we've come, it's come to this, where I'm getting excited about post-practice press conferences, Brad. You know the NFL season is right around the corner when I'm excited about that kind of stuff. Um, and anyways, in his post, uh, uh, practice press conference, he, uh, he basically said, Hey, we're working on something. We, we hope to have something done here, <laughs> here pretty soon. Look, Alvin Kamara, um, that being a former junior college football player, uh, Alvin Kamara, um, you know, rushed for almost 800 yards last year. Um, and his, uh, average rush was, was four point seven yards a carry um and he had like 500 yards um in in reception yards um so alvin Kamara is a different kind of running back than um your favorite guy uh from a fantasy football perspective which would be derrick henry um you know yeah. a pounder a bruiser right i mean alvin Kamara's production last year fell off as a result of losing mark ingram I mean, that's the reality of it. He, he was a better player in year one and two than he was in year three because he didn't get any rest. He was on the field at all times. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Derrick Henry. I'd like to mention Derrick Henry. If you look at, for people that don't know what the fantasy ADP is, that stands for average draft position. You can look it up online. You Google it, fantasy ADP, and they'll give you the average draft position where guys are drafted in all of their, in all of their drafts. Uh, they have, you know, thousands of people go in there every day and they, they have mock drafts and stuff like that. And then they average who's the top player taken overall. And right now it's Christian McCaffrey, uh, who is pretty much going number one in almost every league. And then, you know, Saquon Barkley uh, is, as I think the consensus number two. Um, but I would say, take a look at Derrick Henry and, and in my league, which has kind of gotten a unique rules. Um, uh, you know, my league goes on length of touchdown. Derrick Henry, who would have figured that he had more long touchdowns than anybody in the league last year? Um, you know, I know that there's some concerns in Tennessee that, you know, defensive coordinators are going to try to figure – are, are going to start to figure out 
how to stop that thing. And will Ryan Tannehill be able to be the player that he was last year when he had a huge breakout season? But, um, you know, I think Derrick Henry is a pretty safe running back. He was the number one scoring guy in my league the second half of the year. And despite the fact that Christian McCaffrey and Saquon Barkley are, are going one and two overall in the fantasy ADP, I think Derrick Henry is a, is a good pick at three if, 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 if you're out there drafting. Um, um, because, you know, a lot of people like Ezekiel Elliott and, and they like Aaron Jones and they like, uh, you know, Dalvin Cook and Alvin Kamara. And, and for some reason or another, the rookie in Kansas City, Edward Solaire, is, is all the way up, uh, you know, going uh, early as uh, the number seven or eight running back. And so, um, you know, but when it comes to fantasy football, I think the key is what, are, what is your rules? What is your scoring system? And, and figure out which guys uh, are the best at your scoring system. Because if you're in a touchdown-only league where you get a straight six points, that's going to mean different than it is if you're in a league like mine where you get more points for a long touchdown than a short touchdown. So um, I don't have any sage advice for anybody. Have fun. Fantasy football drafts are one of the great things that you get to do each year. It's kind of a drag this year that in many cases people are not going to be able to get to do together and be able to do them face-to-face. -face, but – it's a heck of a lot of fun. I play in multiple leagues, and I have a lot of talented guys in my league that are more or less bean counters or CFOs. They're guys that are just uh, counting the numbers. They don't really have any emotion tied to it. That makes it kind of difficult, but um, at the same time, um, it's it's one of the more fun times of the year. And frankly, I think three, four weeks ago, maybe six weeks ago, I think most of us didn't really think we were even going to get a chance to pick a fantasy football team. But it, it's starting to look like a reality, like this thing's going to happen. Yeah. I, I, I think the um, uh, protocols that the uh, NFL has put into place um, have, have, you know, for the most part, really worked out to this point. It will, it will be interesting to see what happens, um, you know, when, you know, guys like you might, you would like to say Joe Mixon uh, get loose in a city that they don't live in. Um, and, you know, you know, is there going to, is there going to be issues with that, with that sort of stuff? Yeah, we, we, you know, we almost instituted a new rule or a new pool in my league. We were all going to throw in 10 bucks, and I hate to make light of it because it's the, the coronavirus is not a funny thing and it's not uh, something to make light of, but we almost threw in an extra $10 to see which team is going to uh, be put on uh, – uh, uh, it's going to have to quarantine first, you know? And so we, we decided against that for all the, all the right reasons, but uh, Joe Mixon's name did come up. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure there's a prop bet for that in Vegas, uh, in Vegas someplace. Real quick, um, before we get out of here, um, uh, speaking of Joe Mixon, he signed a contract extension earlier uh, in the day. Um, yeah, Brad, we are bringing the latest news to the world. Look at that. Uh, so Joe Mixon uh, is getting a whopping $12 million a year. Uh, your favorite running back in the NFL this year is Derrick Henry. He's going to get 12.5. Um, you know, Bill O'Brien, who is the, uh, you know, head coach of the Houston Texans. He's also their general manager who made really um, arguably one of the worst trades of all time earlier this year where he, he got rid of, uh, really, seriously, one of the best wide receivers. And in exchange for that, he received a $13 million a year contract that he's got to absorb for an absolutely broken down running back. Like, the only good news for him is, is, is that Nick Foles isn't his starting quarterback right now because then they'd really be in trouble. Like, You're really I, into Nick Foles. I mean, I don't know what you got against this guy. I, I'll tell you what right now. Most overrated fantasy football quarterback this year, the guy that's going to be taken higher than he should be in the entire league is going to be Carson Wentz. Yeah, uh, he's already injured. He, I don't even think he practiced today. Um, so. but, man, you are keeping up on everything. I mean, uh, <laughs> the car, you're getting the, the red flags on the Carson Wentz practices. <laughs> I'm, uh, no, I mean, you know, I'm in the home office all day because we're quarantining still here in, in Northern California. And, you know, I got the uh, you know, NFL network just running, you know, just on, on the ticker. So I occasionally 
I'm on a phone call or or whatever, and I glance up and and I see the I see the latest, and um, yeah, good old good old car. Yeah, look, um, I I get that what Nick Foles did in Philadelphia was special, and I was I was so happy to see him, you know, win a Super Bowl, and he's the reason that they actually uh, he actually did that, um, which is once again fantastic. Um, that being said. Um, you know, sort of seen where he's gone since then. What happened to him in Jacksonville um, is is something that um, was just so hard for me to watch, and and even more difficult to watch was you know how much money he was actually getting made. He was getting paid to to be that bad um, for for a football team. So seeing him go to the Chicago Bears, it was like. It was like Christmas when he when he got he he got picked up by the Bears this year and they gave him all that money. And I'm like, what the hell are the Bears doing? You can clearly tell when a player in the National Football League is sort of near the end of their career. This isn't. I think I any- just figured this whole deal out. <laughs> I think I figured. I just think I think I figured this whole deal out. Wasn't it Nick Foles that defeated your Minnesota Vikings in the NFC Championship game? Uh, destroyed him. It wasn't even yes. close. I, I figured it out. This is why you hate Nick Foles so much. <laughs> You're so transparent, Tabo. <laughs> it wasn't that. So, so, I, so, so David Johnson, <laughs> back to David Johnson. Now, you've totally jinxed the Vikings now. You just know that Nick Foles is going to come off the bench and he's just going to light up the Vikings secondary in the second half of a game this year. That's, that's why I'm saying just, just watch, watch. By the time we post this podcast, he will be the starting quarterback of the Chicago Bears, and the Bears are going to win the division. He'll get a raise. He's going to get a new contract. He's going to, yeah, he's going to get twenty million a year for five. Yeah, I, it's because I jinxed anyway. It. I know I threw you off on your whole Houston Texas no, no. thing. I have no idea where that thing was going. No, but I mean, yeah, uh, you know, David Johnson getting all that money. Bill O'Brien doing a horrific job as a general manager. You look at sort of um, uh, some of the other running backs in, in, in the league that get paid big bucks. See, and now you, I fully expect David Johnson to run for 2,500 yards this year. <laughs> right, right. I mean, like at least 1,000, right? And, and right. you know that he, you know it's going to be five or 600 yards, you know, because that's, that's who he is. Look, I'm not saying he shouldn't still be in the National Football League. I'm just saying that he's probably not worth the $13 million a year. It, it would be another thing if Houston, if, if Bill O'Brien. So what bothers me about Bill O'Brien is he's, in my opinion, he's done a, a fantastic job as a coach. He's, he's done a good job as a coach. He just doesn't do a good job, you know, shopping for the ingredients. And, and then he, he has to do, you know, as a head coach, he's got to do a bunch of smoke and mirror type things to, to actually get through the season in any real effective way. So that's um, that's really where where I'm at with um, with with Bill O'Brien. <laughs> All right, I think well, you need to put a whole new story out there on the disturbance just on Bill O'Brien. It sounds to me like you got a little something you need to get off your chest. Yeah, there will be a there will be um, a, a blog about it. Uh, I'm sure in <laughs> in the near future on the uh, on the Mighty Rip website. All right, Mr. Hoyseth, we've got to get out of here. Uh, any last quick thoughts on your end? I, I gave you my last quick thoughts like t- 12 minutes ago. <laughs> I have no more thoughts. Okay. I got to prepare for a couple of fantasy football drafts. That's what I really got to do. Uh, so I hope everybody else uh, has a great weekend. Have a fun holiday weekend and, uh, you know, go out and win your league uh, by drafting conservatively in the first three rounds. I love it. Sage advice for the disturbance and Brad Hoyseth. I'm Dave Duvall reminding you that for more semi-witty sports commentary, make sure you check out our website at mighty.rip. Thank you for tuning in to The Disturbance, hosted by Dave Duvall. Please go ahead and subscribe to the show 